Hi there, and welcome to today's episode of Alex Ho and the History Show. Mr. Ho, Mr. Ho, what are we going to learn about today? Glad you asked, Kyle. Today we'll be learning about the Han Chinese Dynasty. Mr. Ho, Mr. Ho, what's a dynasty? Well, in simple terms, a dynasty is a line of rulers who originate from the same lineage or family. Mr. Ho, Mr. Ho, were the Han big and powerful like the Zhou Dynasty? Ah, shut up, Kyle. But yes, they were. Probably the biggest and most powerful of the early dynasties in China. For you see, during the Han Dynasty era, 206 BCE to 220 CE, a lot of innovation occurred. From the opening of the Silk Roads, to emphasis of new family lifestyles, the Han Dynasty was definitely a great period of prosperity in Southern Asia. Alex Ho and the History Show. Alex Ho and the History Show. Alex, 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 Alex Ho and the History Show. Wow, cool. Alex Ho and the History Show. The Hans are Asian. Alex, 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 this episode brought to you by the Silk Roads. People always think the Han Dynasty was one dynasty, but in fact it refers to two dynasties under the same name. What I mean by this is that there was the Western Han Dynasty and the Eastern Han Dynasty. The Western Han Dynasty was established in 206 BCE after the fall of the Qin Dynasty, when a determined military commander named Liu Bang resided in Qin Unite all of China. Liu Bang was responsible for the early success of the Han Dynasty. He recruited people to work for his government based on their abilities and not on their birth blood, birthright or wealth, which coincided with the implementation of Confucianism, which we'll cover in a bit. Though Liu Bang recognized the errors of the Sin Qin's centralized rule, the Han Dynasty still continued to utilize that notion supported by Man in Heaven, which originated from the Zhou Dynasty, where the emperor was thought to be chosen by the powers of heaven to lead the Chinese people. And at one point, Bang would exploit the benefits of the centralized rule, but in 200 BCE, he was besieged by the Xiongnu. Mr. Ho, Mr. Ho, who, what were the Shang Yu? Shut up, Kyle, we'll cover that in a bit. Because Liu Bang did not receive any aid from his church's subordinates, the Han Dynasty continued to implement a centralized rule. While Liu Bang is credited with the establishment and early success of the dynasty, Emperor Han Wu Di was another great emperor. Wu Di believed in two policies. One, Tui Ying Ling, a policy to strengthen the state by weakening the power of the feudal lords. Two, the imperial expansion policy. With these two policies, Wu Di was able to build an enormous bureaucracy to administer his empire while battling Xiongnu. The Xiongnu were not a what, they were a who. The Xiongnu were nomadic people from the steppes of Central Asia and were superb horsemen that used their mobility to raid villages and trading areas. Eventually, Wu Di would invade Central Asia with his vast armies and pacified the long Central Asian corridor extending to modern Afghanistan. Because of these two amazing feats, Wu Di ensured the Han Dynasty's prosperity. The Chinese of this era were posing major challenges. For one, they had to deal with problems their predecessors, the Qin Dynasty, left to them. In particular, the Great Wall, which is eh, somewhere over there. It's a common assumption that the Great Wall is a significant part of Chinese history, when in fact has a quite demoralizing past. For one thing, the Great Wall was built through forced peasant labor, so when the early Han emperors took over, they removed many of the taxes that the Qin had implemented on the peasantry class. Likewise, they taxed the merchants much more strictly. Besides the silk roads, a lot of other things benefit economic growth in China during this time. For example, paper. Although the invention of paper has been associated with the Chinese during the Han Dynasty, in different forms it's been around for quite some time. As early as 3000 BCE, the Egyptians had papyrus, which was made out of reeds found along Nile instead of plant press fibers. Just as you see today, paper is really important. It was easier to write on, which made the documentation things much simpler, as well as the transfer ideas more efficient. The creation of such a thing would allow Chinese calligraphy to become a popular pastime. Combined with prosperity of Silk Rose, the Han Dynasty was truly an era of great diffusion. Mr. Ho, Mr. Ho, we have atomic weapons and steel weapons today. Ah, yes we do, Kyle. But you see, armies back then had weapons made of mainly copper and tin, which were not storable nor strong. A few inches later. The period of warring states, 475 BC to 221 BC, was when the three main philosophies emerged to regain political and social stability. These were Confucianism, Legalism, and Taoism. First was Legalism, which was created by Han Feitzi. The core idea of Legalism was pushed to push everyone into cultivation or military services. This is what brought the Qin Dynasty together after the period of warring states. 
and was even used in the early Han to rear a stable state. But legalism imposed a strict doctrine that severely punished violators of even small crimes, which made legalism fall out in the later Han. Because really no one ever likes being punished. Still, legalism was important since future governments partially used legalism whenever it began to lose power. While the Chinese would use legalism in an attempt to regain their declining power, Confucianism, created by Kong Fu Zi, was used by governments to maintain prosperity. Fu Zi believed people needed advanced education for an ideal government. Han Wu Li saw how this is important for the Han Dynasty, so he created the Confucian education system to prepare young men for government that would be used for all future governments. Originally, political power coincided with how rich a man was, but this new system gave power to intellectuals, making it much more fair. However, Confucianism directly contrasted Taoism since the Taoists believed if they learned how to live in harmony with nature, over time they could bring harmony to society as a whole. Created by Lao Tzu, it serves as a counterbalance to Confucian tradition, but never took place as a major political thing. Though, it did become more popular as Mahayana Buddhism spread from India to China in 213 BCE, since it was similar in high moral standards. Buddhism continued to gain more popularity, especially in the Tang Dynasty, since it promised salvation and promoted high education. So why was Confucianism able to become a more, a more popular philosophy? First, a strong sense of filial piety was incorporated. What is filial piety, me ask? To understand this, please, join me on... Consider the following. Throughout Chinese history, the family has played a central role in society in terms of both public and private affairs. For instance, we have the veneration of ancestors, which was a belief emphasized by every Chinese family, that revolved around the idea of ancestors being in the form of spirits after death. This, in turn, emphasized the respect needed for the elderly. At the same time, every family was patriarchal, meaning that there was an emphasis on the male. And because of this emphasis on the male, a lot of males played huge public service roles in the government. Um, at the same time, the woman was highly subjected to male dominance, and because of this, their roles were clearly defined in the household, as in taking care of children and washing dishes and cooking. Thank you for joining us on. Consider the following. Han's social structure was comprised of three tiers. Aristocrats, bureaucrats, and scholars were at the top of this hierarchy. The second tier was made up of skilled laborers like farmers, craftsmen, and artisans. However, farmers were more respected for their production of food crops. The bottom tier consisted of unskilled laborers such as surgeons, slaves, and merchants. Merchants were viewed lowly by scholars for being social parasites, and as a result were viewed ranked at the bottom despite their enormous wealth and influence. This shows how the Han social system did not take into account wealth or power and just dictated status. Note that above all three tiers is the emperor and the royal family as the overseers of China and his people. Though Emperor Wu Di was set a strong precedent for a Han dynasty in political, cultural, and economic matters, Wang Mei's rise to power. Mr. O, Mr. O, who is Wang Mei? Ahem! <clears throat> Wang Mei's rise to power marked the end of the Western Han dynasty in 9C. Now, Kyle, I was going to explain who Wang Mei was after I finished my sentence, but you had to interrupt me. How rude! Anyways, Wang Mei used the mandate of heaven in 9C to justify his actions and established the Xin dynasty, at which literally means a new dynasty. The new dynasty, however, was short lived because he would try to implement a series of wide ranging reforms such as land redistribution that sparked a peasant rebellion group called the Red Eyebrows. The Red Eyebrows put an end to Wang Mei's reign in 23 CE. When the Xin dynasty officially ended, Liu Xie, a descendant of Liu Bang of the Western Han dynasty, established the Eastern Han dynasty. Now I pass me mention that the general term of the Han dynasty incorporates the Western and Eastern Han dynasties. The reason behind this is Liu Xiu decided to move the capital of Luoyang, at which was east of Chang'an, the capital of the Western Han people. This change in leadership and location marked the comeback of the Han Chinese. After the Han's great comeback, the Eastern Han dynasty wasn't as successful. Tension amongst the rich and poor rose when the peasants would organize rebellions against the nobles in hopes of attaining societal equality. Just imagine having barely enough to eat and you see your fancy neighbors with a giant fish, and bowls, and bowls, and bowls of rice at their dinner table. And we don't all know how much Asians love their rice. Anywho, the most destructive of these rebellions was the Yellow Turban Rebellion, where the peasants' rebels were held yellow turbans. These peasants were not only motivated by the famine and poverty that reappeared, but were also angered by the corruption endowed by the Ten Attendants, a group of Inuits that held a great amount of influence over the Emperor of China. This combined with poor harvest, poor leaders, as well as hatred amongst the two primary social classes, led to end the last ruler, Emperor Liu Xie, in 220 CE. In the period of warring states, legalism was used to bring the Qin dynasty together and was also used in the early Han. But Confucianism is what dominated the Han dynasty. Confucianism gained popularity since it supported filial piety, which is always a part of Chinese family relations. The first emperor of the Han was Liu Bang. He created a centralized government, and then Han Wudi helped push the economy and create the Confucian civil exam. Their success came from cutting taxes and pushing agriculture. The mandate of heaven also gave rulers divine authority to rule. Below the emperor were the bureaucrats, then skilled laborers, and at the bottom, peasants. 
The Han experienced great economic success with the silk roads and the development of paper and iron. But the later Han began to decline for poor harvest, peasant rebellions, and weak rulers. Fighting. 